I want to teach you a new course today. It's called Your Love Defends Me by Matt Mayer. And it goes like this. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. So right there where you where you are, uh, just uh, sing this out to the Lord. It may be a little awkward, but sing it out anyway. He is worthy. Let's sing together. Dream.
strength of my soul Your love defends me Your love defends me And when I feel that I'm all alone Your love defends me Your love defends me
sing this with me. We're just going to sing Amen. 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 God, we praise you. God, we praise you. That's all there is to with me. Amen. 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 God, we praise you. God, we praise you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God, we praise you. Oh, God, we praise you. Amen. 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 God, we praise you. God, we praise you. Well, good morning, everyone. I am glad that we were able to connect. Uh, through this medium since we can't uh, gather together physically. And I just want to take a moment to express my appreciation that you are all joining us this morning and to also just say I'm I'm very grateful for your patience. I know that we had to uh, cancel in-person service a few weeks ago because of a COVID situation. And now we are having to uh, cancel in-person service just simply because we want to keep everybody safe as we... uh, hunker down and endure this crazy weather that we're having. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Would you take a uh, moment to pray with me before we jump in and get started? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you that as we're going to celebrate this morning, you are omnipresent. You are everywhere at all times, and you're really everywhere at all times in all times. So you're here with us while we are pre-recording the message, and you are with us while we are watching the message together live on Facebook. We thank you that your presence is real, that it is, it, it is, it is really nearly tangible, and that your mercies really are new every morning, that as the sun rises, we can be reminded that, uh, your mercies and your grace are both also rising anew in our hearts. And so we are filled with joy, inexpressible, and full of glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 139. Um, You can turn in Psalm 139, or if you receive the email, then you have the sermon notes for uh, this morning, and, and the full text of the scripture is there in your notes as well. So we're just going to start out turning over to Psalm 139. And basically this morning, what we're going to do is is a bit of a devotional meditation on three critical truths that we find in Psalm 139. In fact, these three truths that are celebrated in Psalm 139 
are kind of Christian theology 101. The, these are kind of the bedrock uh, attributes of God that one would study if they were taking a theology course. What are those three attributes? They are, uh, and these are attributes that, that, that even though we may nuance them different, uh, most all Christians in all times in all streams of Christianity would affirm. Uh, number one is that God is omniscient. In other words, he knows all that can be known about anything that can be known. He knows all that can be known about anything that can be known. Number two, God is omnipresent. That means that he is fully present at all times and in all places. Fully present at all times and in all places. In other words, there is no place where God is not and, and that he didn't parcel himself out where he's, 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 he's like 90% present in one place, but only 10% present in another. No, God fills the universe. All things exist in him. In all things, Paul says, uh, are held together in Christ. God is fully present at all times in all places. And number three, that God is omnipotent. That means God possesses unlimited power and he can do anything that he chooses to do. He possesses unlimited power, and he can do anything that he chooses to do. Now, fortunately for us, as we study the scriptures and as we study Christian uh, thought and Christian uh, history, particularly the history of theology and the history of doctrine, um, what we discover is that when we say God can do anything he chooses to do, gratefully, what is revealed to us about God is that he chooses to act according to his nature. Now, this distinction is very important because if you can imagine uh, an evil God, uh, an angry God, a God that is out to harm his creation, if that God is omniscient and omnipresent and omnipotent, well, frankly, if the God isn't good or he isn't trustworthy or he isn't for us, that actually is a pretty scary um, uh, concept to imagine. But fortunately for us, although we affirm that God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, and God is omnipotent, we also know this from Scripture and from his own self-disclosure through the incarnation of the Word of God, who is Jesus, like the incarnation that we just celebrated last uh, a couple of months ago during Christmas time. What we also know about God when we celebrate that, that, that he is all-knowing, uh, everywhere and all powerful and that he can do whatever he chooses to do. Thank the Lord. What we know is that God is for us and that God is love. Therefore, as we contemplate his omniscience, his omnipresence and his omnipotence, let us also remember the context in which we are engaging in these contemplations, which is rooted in the revelation that God chooses to show us grace and boundless loving kindness. Just a few verses that kind of set the tone for that reality. First of all, Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? Everything that came previously in chapter 8. And this is the phrase that I want us to meditate on this morning. If God is for us, who can be against us? In other words, it's a rhetorical question. And the assumption is, is that, we, that the, his readers would understand that there is no if when we contemplate whether or not God is for us. God is for us. That's what Paul is celebrating. The, the fact that God is for us begs the question, then, then what do we have to fear? Because who can possibly be against us if God is in fact for us, which he is? The, the, the other verse that kind of helps us root our contemplations in the context of the nature and character of God is simply 1 John 4, 8. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. Not simply that God is loving, but that God, his very essence is love. So when we talk about God, we're talking about love because the two ideas are synonymous. God's nature is love and what we understand of, as love is an expression of who he is. Ephesians 1, 7 and 9 says this, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. 
that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ. I really love verse 8. Remember what Paul is celebrating is the fact that he has richly poured out on us his grace. He was just, the, the last word of the last phrase is according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us. In fact, some translations for this word richly poured out on us says that he lavished upon us. In his grace, God goes high, goes, goes uh, higher. He goes um, high and above what we might expect in order to pour his grace on us. The Old Testament counterpart to this celebration, we might say, is David In Psalm 23, when he writes, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So it's not just that God chooses to look favorably toward us in forgiveness and in kindness, but but he actually allows his goodness and mercy to chase after us all of our lives, even those seasons of our life when we are not aware that his mercy is chasing us down. And finally, Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, where the prophet Jeremiah celebrates this attribute of God. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So this God who is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent is a God who chooses to lavish grace upon us and renew his mercy toward us every single day. So let's take a moment and break this down out of Psalm 139. What what might it mean practically and devotionally and spiritually? And and as we contemplate how we respond to God in, in our own spiritual rhythm, that God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, and God is omnipotent. Well, number one, God is omniscient, which means he knows all that can be known about anything that can be known. Let's take a moment to read Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6. O Lord, you've examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord, you go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too great for me to even understand. I I, I love how the psalmist kind of crescendos as he celebrates these remarkable and and marvelous Uh, attributes of God or posture toward God that's rooted in his mercy and his blessing. And eventually says he, he celebrates because these ideas are so sweet. They are so comforting. They are so good that in the end, we have to admit that they're incomprehensible to some extent. This knowledge is so far beyond, beyond us. It's too great for us to understand. Notice specifically when we talk about the omniscience of God, again, a God who's all knowing, I don't know about you, but a God who's all knowing and yet easily offended would be a very scary God indeed, because frankly, a lot of what is worth knowing about me is not worth knowing about me. And yet God knows all of those things. Now, notice what uh, the psalmist celebrates in verses 2b and verse 4. You know my thoughts Even when I'm far away, you know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. So so notice what, what, what he's celebrating. The Lord is mindful both of what I say and what I think. In other words, he is aware of the thoughts, that inner dialogue that's going on before there is an outer expression of that dialogue. And the truth is, there there are way more words going on in our minds that we never get around to saying than there are the words that we actually end up saying. So, so, so it's remarkable that not just he knows what we say, but he knows what we're thinking before we say it. In other words, that place in your heart, in your mind, that inner dialogue that's constantly flowing, God is present there. 
I, I'm not saying that he's necessarily directing all the thoughts that are taking place, but he is present there and he's aware of it. He knows it. In fact, you, I think in some ways the psalmist is celebrating that God is present and he understands both the conscious things that I say and the conscious things that I think, but even more remarkably and more comforting is this. He is aware of the subconscious reality of my life. He knows things about me that I don't even know about myself. Therefore, when we come before God, there is never any need to pose or pretend or to fake piety or self-righteousness before God. And this is important because we've got to get past this. We've got to get past this sense that we're obligated to somehow pretend and to show God what we think he wants to see. Because if we continue to to play that game, if we continue to pose and pretend like that we don't have doubt or anger or lust or, um, or indulgence or addictions or doubts, If we do that, then we're never truly being present before God. We're only presenting a version of ourselves before God. And therefore, I will never know intimacy with God until I'm willing to bring my doubts, my fears, my temptations, and my shadow before God. The truth is, we all possess a shadow that we would rather keep hidden from those we love, that we'd rather keep hidden from the public. And sometimes our self-deception can be so great that we're highly committed to keeping our, the reality of our shadow self hidden even from ourselves. But you see, God already knows both the best version of me and he knows the worst version of me. He knows the best version of who I am and he knows the best version of who I could be. He knows the worst version of who I am, and he knows the worst version of who I could be. And yet he still chooses to posture himself toward me with forgiveness, with grace that is lavished upon me, and with mercy that is new every morning. He understands what, why you and I do what we do. He understands what you and I do think or or why you and I think what we think. He understands why you and I feel what we feel. And he understands why you and I doubt what we doubt. He's aware of all the variables that go in constructing who we are, both uh, both in our virtues and in our vices. I know it's a little bit cheesy and you'll see it in your notes. And I admit it's a little cheesy. However, and and I don't always like cheesy, but sometimes things are cheesy and cliche because they're just so true and they're just so real. There's no way to uncliche them. But one of the ways I'm sure you've heard of thinking about the word intimacy, and this is not like an official etymology of the word, but it is a helpful description, is that one way to think about the essence of intimacy is by thinking of it as into me see, into me see. And, and, and so the foundational reality for cultivating a healthy intimacy with God is understand that he already sees into us and he still chooses to chase after us in mercy and loving kindness. And therefore, we don't have to be afraid even of those things we fear and hate about ourselves, we can bring these things before God. As we've often said, if you're going to believe in God, you might as well live like you have one. And we have a God from whom we never need to hide because it wouldn't do any good even if we did. So God is omni, omniscient. He knows everything. Secondly, God is omnipresent. Again, an omnipresent God that doesn't uh, posture himself toward us in forgiveness and mercy might be kind of scary. And the truth is, the fact that God is omnipresent is actually rather frightening for a lot of people because they have not 
uh, required their ideology about the nature and character of God to bow to the revelation of God that we see in the face of Jesus. But once we do that, once we see that Jesus is not simply God-like, but that God is Jesus-like, once, once we begin to see that God has chosen to forgive us, to lavish his grace upon us, and to allow his loving kindness to chase after us and to allow us to experience his mercy, not just once, but anew that like, like the mercy is renewed. Like every morning is the renewal of a new day. Then we can truly understand the comfort that can come from understanding that God is omnipresent, which means he is fully present at all times in all places. In one sense, God is with us on February 14th while we are engaged in this meditation together. And in another sense, he is also with me on February 12th, uh, Friday afternoon, while I'm sitting in my home office recording this on my computer. God is fully present. He's fully present at all times and in all places. So we, we, we pick up in verse 7 as the psalmist celebrates. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Darkness and light are the same to you. There has never been a place where God has not been. There will never be a place where God is not present. Wherever you are physically, God is there. Wherever you are spiritually, God is there. Wherever you are emotionally, God is there. And wherever you are existentially, God is there. He is right there with you regardless of where you may be in your intellectual, spiritual, or your faith journey, whether you're in a season of great joy and confidence, or you are in a season of despair and doubt, God is right there with you. And the the um, strength or weakness of your faith in no way hinders his ability and his reality of being there with you wherever you might be. Notice that the psalmist celebrates the truth that God is even with us in the grave. He is with us in the night and he is with us in the darkness. Eventually we will all be in the grave and God will be there. But he is also with us in the night and the darkness, whether that be physically or emotionally or spiritually or existentially. See, the truth is most likely your spiritual fervor And your beliefs and your convictions are going to ebb and flow and alter. But you have to understand that God is with you in this journey. And in fact, he is walking you through this journey. And what you might find that even in your dark night of the soul, God, the spirit has even been directing you down this leg of your journey. Why? Because God's goal is for us, for me, for you, for all of us. God's goal is for you to trust him, not just your beliefs about him. And it's very important as finite creatures, if we are going to walk in humility with God, that we have to understand that our ability to understand him It will always be less than who he actually is because we are finite creatures with finite minds trying to understand the infinite. And fortunately, this is the beauty of the Christian doctrine of the incarnation. The infinite has enclosed itself in finiteness so that he could walk among us, so he could reveal himself to us. But we have to always understand that our understanding and our attempts to articulate that understanding will always be less than 
the reality. And so I don't want to make my beliefs or my ideology an idol that replaces the truth of who God is beyond my ability to comprehend, beyond my ability to comprehend him, because his goal for me is to trust him, not just my beliefs about him. So we see that God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, and God is omnipotent. And the fact that God is omnipotent omnipotent simply means that God possesses unlimited power and he can do anything that he chooses to do. God possesses unlimited power and he can do anything that he chooses to do. Now, I suppose that we could have a moment and a discussion about some ways in which that might create questions for us as though as such as why doesn't he do some of the things I think he ought he ought to do and those are fair questions to wrestle with one another in community fair questions to bring before God and to wrestle with the spirit but they're outside of the scope of what we're discussing here this morning right now we're just beginning with what we see celebrated both in this um psalm and in the history of christian thought which is that god is omnipotent he possesses unlimited power and he can do anything that he chooses to do let's read verses 13 through 18 you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb thank you for making me so wonderfully complex Another translation says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But I do like this, that the psalmist celebrates the complexity of who we are. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. We're we're complex physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of the sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. Now, this is really a remarkable uh, psalm, and, and, and I love it that we have a history here in the Bible, in our scriptures, of God revealing himself um, through, um, by revealing himself through the words of scripture and using all kinds of genres in order to do that. Uh, Some history, some wisdom literature, some prophetic literature, uh, some um, uh, uh, teaching uh, epistles and letters and so forth. But he also chooses to reveal himself through poetry. And here we've got several poetic images. We know that God is spirit. He doesn't have a physical body and a physical brain like we do. And yet it's, it's as if the psalmist is imagining that when God creates us, he writes the book of our life and that that book has been pre-written. He's written it down and he knows everything about it. He knows everything that is in it and is within it. And, and so, and so what he says is when I was born, when you knit me together, you wrote the book of my life and you've, you know, all the details. So the question is, what does this omnipotent God choose to do with his unlimited power? And this is what both Genesis 1 and 2 and Psalm 139 celebrates. The omnipotent God who has unlimited power chooses to create. He chooses to create you. He he chooses to create you with intentionality. In other words, he has intent. He has plans. Look at what's verse, verse 16, as we referred to just a few minutes ago. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Now, as we said before, the psalmist, of course, is speaking poetically to communicate that we can trust that God has dignified us with purpose. God has bestowed upon you the dignity of purpose. There's a reason. 
One way we might say it is this way. In love, love created you so that you could fulfill the purpose of love. In love, love created you so that you could fulfill the purpose of love. Another way of saying it is we could, of course, do, we could probably say it better by just quoting the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. See, God created ahead of time for us to do, which means your existence was preceded by purpose. Intentionality existed before you came into being. And in fact, it was that purpose and intention and intentionality that, that informed your being created because you've got stuff to do and God puts you together perfectly. You're his workmanship. You're his masterpiece. He, he fashioned you together so that you would be equipped to do the thing that he intended you to do. This word for workmanship is actually the word poema. You can probably see the word poem in there. You are God's poem. It simply means it's a work. It's a thing that's made. It's a workmanship that he purposely put together because he had purpose for you before you were even born. Think about this for just a moment. The, the reason why we take such inexpressible joy in our children and in our creations is because we are made in the image of God. To create and to celebrate that creation is an expression of the character of God. The reason why we do those things is because he does these things. We are like this because this is what he is like. Now, the psalm rounds up or ends up or comes to a close with a prayer. It's a prayer that I would suggest that you make part of your personal liturgy. It's a prayer that I pray uh, many, many, many times uh, throughout the day and throughout the weeks and throughout the months. It's found in verses 23 and 24, where he simply prays this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Search me, know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. Point out those things that offend you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I think that's a great model for how we respond, how we respond to this God of love, this God of forgiveness, this God of grace, this God of renewed mercy and loving kindness, is that we pray and we ask for eyes to see the truth of it and for the faith to believe it with all our hearts and for the courage to act as though it is true because it is. So take a moment this morning, this afternoon, if the meteorologists are correct, you're going to have a lot of time on your hands to take some time to contemplate and to pray. And when you do, ask God to open your eyes so that you can see him, see him as he really is. And in that process, to show you ways in which you believe things about him that simply are not true. And then repent and reject all your limiting beliefs about him. Look to Jesus in order to see the Father. This is perhaps one of the most important disciplines for a healthy disciple, a healthy follower of Jesus, someone who chooses to be Jesus's apprentice, apprentice in the school of life. One of the most important things that you can do is learn to look to Jesus in order to see the Father. And at the same time, Stop looking to anything other than Jesus in order to see the Father. Stop looking at your warped understanding of what a father or the father is. Stop looking to religion that is in any way rooted in the interest of man in order to know what God is really like. You, you don't need to do these things. 
You can open the scriptures, you can go to the gospels, and you can look at Jesus, and you can look to Jesus in order to see the Father. Perhaps one of the most important things that you can do for your own experience of revival and renewal is just take a season to read Jesus your faith. It's a powerful thing. This is what happened to me when we gave ourselves over our community to the study of the book of Luke. I so, I'm so grateful for that time in which I had a, a, a prolonged time to look at the life of Jesus and through that stare into the face of Jesus and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit experience the reality of Jesus in such a way that it began to slowly reframe my understanding of the Father, that the Holy Spirit did his work and he tore down strongholds that had raised themselves up in my mind against the true knowledge of God as he is. It, it was those thoughts, and, and it wasn't just sinful thoughts that competed with the image of God for me. It was also my man-centered theological thoughts. It was my religious thoughts. These things created strongholds in my mind that for a time prevented me from seeing God as he really was. And unfortunately, when we do that, when we worship a false God, we, be, we begin to live false lives because we become like that which we worship. Thanks be to God, he delivered me by calling me into an extended season of studying the book of Luke and looking at the life of Jesus and the Holy Spirit met me there. And he gave me faith and he gave me repentance and he continues to take me along that journey. And it is my prayer that he will do the same for you. So stop looking to anything other than Jesus in order to see the Father and start proactively with great intention looking to Jesus in order to see the Father. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you that you are omniscient, you are omnipresent, and you are omnipotent. And we thank you that the fact that you know all, that you can do all, and that you are everywhere brings us great comfort because we understand your nature and your character. You are exactly like Jesus. You are a God who has chosen to lavish grace and forgiveness upon us. You are a God who has chosen to cause your goodness and mercy to follow us all the days of our lives. You are a God who is steadfast in loving kindness and whose mercies are new every morning. So Lord, I pray for myself. I pray for all those listening this morning. I pray for all those who will listen sometime in the future. I pray for our community. And I ask that we would encounter and embrace the God revealed in Jesus. I pray that you would renew in us a longing to know as we have been known, to walk in the real spiritual power of true intimacy with the Almighty. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.